Um, so first of all, thank you for joining me today. Um, we are going to talk a little bit about Rocky as a performance accelerator. Um, so a few words about me. My name is uh, Slava Schwarzman. I live in Israel, in Kfar Saba, which actually translates to Grandpa's Village, but it's a medium-sized city in Israel. Um, I'm a software engineer at Malnox Technologies. Um, my main interests are the networking stack and the Infiniban. I'll be mostly focusing on Rocky and RDMA. I'm a new committer at Source, and my mentors are Konstantin Belousov, Kib, and Hans-Peter Selaski, H. Selaski. So we, today we are going to talk a little bit about Rocky, or what is Rocky and where it comes from, and a little bit about its history and its current implementation in FreeBSD. Um, we'll talk about a little bit about complementary protocols um, and why do we need it for Rocky. And then we'll have a look at some graphs and some performance acceleration for storage protocols using RDMA. So before starting to talk about RDMA or Rocky, we need to understand a little bit about its history. Rocky actually comes from the InfiniBand world, and RDMA is, com is coming from the InfiniBand world. InfiniBand is basically um, a networking stack, just like Ethernet, but it's only in creations for the layer 1, 2, and 3, 3 and 4. And its main characteristics are that it has low latency, high bandwidth, and very low CPU utilization. It can achieve those benefits or characteristics by using RDMA. RDMA, which stands for Remote Direct Memory Access. I'm pretty sure that most of you are familiar with DMA, basically the ability for hardware to directly access memory regions without any involvement of the CPU. RDMA basically allows remote direct memory access, basically allows the HCA to access memory on remote hosts. The current implementation of RDMA allows hardware offload, basically packet processing in the hardware instead of doing them in the kernel itself. And of course, RDMA was designed with security concerns like protection domains, for example. They have user level access and exchange of keys. The benefits of RDMA are minimal CPU involvement, of course, since the packet processing is actually being offloaded into the hardware, hence the CPU doesn't have to work too hard or there is minimal involvement from the CPU. Kernel bypass, for example. We allow user applications to fully bypass our kernel and use, again, those memory regions. Scatter-gather entry support. Basically, RDMA was designed with scatter-gather entry support as definition. Basically, allows you to not allocate continuous memory and just use pieces and scatter gather them. Zero copy basically stands for the fact that unlike traditional sockets where the, where the buffer that's being allocated by the application needs to be copied along the networking stack, in RDMA this buffer is used by the RDMA NIC itself and copied and transferred to the remote host. So, Rocky? Um, so, with that concern in mind that to achieve the benefits of RDMA, you need to change the entire architecture of your network is not something trivial to ask. And hence, Rocky, or RDMA over converged Ethernet, was introduced. Basically, basically RDMA over converged Ethernet allows you to use RDMA benefits over an existing Ethernet fabrics. Rocky is a standard protocol standardized by the IBTA, which stands for InfiniBand Trade Association. And both InfiniBand and Rocky APIs share the same common API. It's interestingly enough to mention that both FreeBSD and Linux, for example, will share the same API because those are the same APIs, <laughs> and that's it. I want to say something about it, but it's enough. <laughs> um, so here is the header layout of the Rocky protocol. Basically, you can see that the InfiniBand things are encapsulated inside. 
in an Ethernet header. The ether type will indicate that the next packet is IBGRH, which stands for InfiniBand Global Routing Header, which actually contains the layer 3 addresses for InfiniBand. And the next header is IBBTH, InfiniBand Base Transport Header, which is the layer 4 header. The main problem with Rocky, or as we will see in a second, with Rocky V1, is the fact that it's limited to its domain, meaning it's not routable. And hence, Rocky V2 was introduced. Rocky V2 is basically a straightforward extension of the Rocky V1 protocol, which allows it, allows it to be routed between different subnets. The change that was done is basically to the headers themselves, we can see this in this diagram. Instead of having, having IBGRH at the layer 3, we now have an IP header. So the ether type in Rocky V2 will indicate that the next header is actually an IP header. And the IP header will indicate that the next header will be UDP header, which will have a specific destination port indicating that this packet is Rocky V2 and we still have the IBBTH and the InfiniBand payload inside. So the current status in FreeBSD is that we have Rocky V2 support both for FreeBSD 11 and FreeBSD 12. Um, Rocky currently s needs a special hardware support, of course. We need hardware support Rocky. And in order to enjoy the RDMA capabilities, you will have to rebuild world and kernel with Offed Yes. So we're currently actually working on make the build kernel with Offed Yes as a default, where you, if you would like, you can change it, of course, to build without Offed. So let's have a quick look at some APIs, or as we call them, verbs. So you can find them on user including Finibend verbs, of course, after building the whole kernel with Offed. And let's have a look at one of those examples, which will be IBV Regamar. IBV Regamar stands for InfiniBand Verbs Mem Reg Register Memory Region. This functionality actually enables you to pin a memory for later use by the hardware. What, what this function ex ex accepts as input are the protection domain, which is basically an entity that connects this memory region to a specific QP or queues. It will have the address and the length of this memory region and the access user and the and the access are the user level flags, which will again for security reasons of course. Each IBV regamar will be followed by IBV D regamar, of course, to free this pinned memory. Taking a quick look and in, in the trace of calling, for example, IBV regular, you will actually work with verbs, which is the API for the user application, which will have um, a callback called regular, which every RDMA user space provider will have to implement, which will be MLX5 regular, for example, which will call IBV command regular, which is again an, a callback for back to the verbs, which will actually issue and write command for the hardware, for, sorry, for the kernel, of course. So going back and forth from the verbs to the RDMA provider, which is in our case MLX5, and back to verbs, makes it basically a generic API from the user application perspective and back a generic API to the, to the kernel code itself. After handling the syscall of write, you, IBU verbs will have its, its character device with an implementation of the write callback, which will call reg user MR, which is again a callback that has to be implemented by the RDMA driver, or by RDMA, sorry, driver of the specific vendor, which will call the MMAP single, which is the actual pinning of that memory. So for some better use case or simpler use case, we have pushed to FreeBSD, both 11 and 12, of course, to contribute off at lib RDMA and lib IB verbs examples. We have multiple user space applications which can be used to investigate or to play with RDMA. Also, we have 
syscontrib rdmaq arping, which is a kernel application example of how can we use basically rdma in the kernel con and recently actually thanks for philip we just pushed the perf test which is a micro benchmarking tool for rdma questions so far awesome so when taking such a protocol as rdma from the infiniband world and putting it into ethernet we have a lot of benefits like let, like just said, we have low latency, we have low CPU utilization, we have great bandwidth, but on the other hand, we encounter into some difficulties. One of those difficulties is the fact that Ethernet is a lossy fabric. In the next part, we will talk what, what does it mean that Ethernet is a lossy fabric, and how can we manage that by introducing a few complementary protocols. And why do we care about it for Rocky, for example? So the fact that Ethernet is a lossy fabric means that Ethernet allows packets to be dropped when buffers overflow. And actually Ethernet is using this to indicate that a congestion, a congestion has occurred in the fabric. From Rocky perspective, when a packet is being dropped, since everything is being offloaded to the hardware, it means that there is a firmware flow, which is very expensive from performance perspective. And another thing that I will demonstrate in the upcoming slide is what exactly is being happening when this retransmission happens. So we can manage those packet loss by or those congestions in two manners. First of all, we can improve the hardware to work faster when retransmission flows are needed. Basically, we were working on this on Connectic 6, and I'll explain what is the difference between what's going on now and what it's planning to do. Or the other approach can be to do a congestion control on the link layer. So from Rocky perspective, when a packet is being dropped, PSN stands for packet sequence number. When you see, for example, if PSN number two was dropped, we will have to retransmit not only this second packet, we will have to, have to retransmit everything from this packet and on. This is, again, because of the way that Rocky works. Important thing to notice is the fact that in InfiniBand world, this is the difference between InfiniBand and Ethernet, there is no such thing as packet loss, basically. The, the idea of InfiniBand is a little bit different. They work with something, they exchange data to transmit as much as can by some different algorithm that if you'd like we can talk a little bit about later but basically the problem that in Ethernet we will have to retransmit everything from this packet and on. One of the mechanisms to avoid that or to manage that will be flow control or global pause. Basically what global pause means that whenever the buffer will reach a certain threshold a special packet called pause will be sent to, from the receiver to the sender side, asking him to completely stop any traffic. Of course, global pause is a link, flow, a link level flow control, and I'll explain it in a second how it works. So basically, let's imagine that we have single receiver and multiple transmitters to the same receiver guys. So those transmitters send a lot of traffic to this receiver, up to the fact that his buffers are starting to get to some point in his threshold. When this happens, this guy will send a pause frame, but instead of sending it for each of the senders, he will send it to the switch, which is directly connected to him. And only when his buffers will get to this certain threshold, he will send a pause frame back to the senders, asking them to stop down. The problem, basically this is a high level view of that. The problem with that, that when we have multiple senders and single receiver, we have multiple types of flows. And each of these flows has its own 
thing. So for example, if we don't want a specific flow to be paused at all, for example, if we have video traffic and, I don't know, HTTP traffic, for example. So we need a way to distinguish between those flows and deal with that. One of the approaches to do this will be priority flow control, or PFC. So basically, we have something called PCP, which is a priority code point. It's a mechanism to put a priority inside the shim, inside the dot one q shim, which is called, also called a villain header, and to distinguish between different types of flows. In this mechanism, with PFC, instead of stopping all the traffic at once from the sender side to the receiver, we can stop each and every priority. Basically, how it works, that we have multiple queues right now, multiple buffers, and we can stop the traffic on each, tra on each buffer by itself instead of stopping altogether. Again, this protocol, PFC, is link level, just like the previous one, just like pause. So two problems with both PFC and global pause is the fact that first, it's link level, and the second one, that the granularity is not that good. Still, we have only eight priorities. And the third, but maybe a little bit different thing, is the fact that in PFC and global pause, what will happen is that we will stop sending any traffic at all, meaning we, instead of slowing down. What basically happens behind the scenes is that when a, a sender receives a pause packet, he will start a counter, which will start sending traffic again only when this counter expires and he didn't receive another pause frame. So the next mechanism called ECN, or explicit congestion notification, is basically an extension of the IP protocol, which allows an end-to-end -end congestion notification almost without dropping any packets. This mechanism works a little bit different. It uses DCQCN, which is very much like RED. And RED stands for Random Early Detection. Basically, the idea is that instead of sending a, a pause frame or a pause asking for the sender to slow down his traffic on a certain threshold, using RED, what happens is that <clears throat> as, as much as if the longer the queue of the packets in the buffers, the higher probability of marking a packet as a, as a congestion experience gets higher. Basically, unlike PFC and global pause, what happens with ECN that the intermediate devices like switches and routers can mark a specific flow that a congestion has occurred, and when the receiver side will get this packet, a regular packet from the flow with congestion experienced, he will send a special packet called CNP, or congestion notification packet, to the sender side asking him to slow down. So from ECN, what we get is much better granularity, and as you can see, instead of stopping the traffic completely, he will ask him to just slow down. So as a little summary for what we've been talking to so far, is first of all that Rocky V2 is routable, unlike Rocky V1, which was introduced in the previous generations of FreeBSD. Rocky is scalable. Rocky is actually being implemented right now in, not implemented, sorry, is used in one of the biggest cloud providers like Azure. Rocky works on Ethernet available distances, meaning that all distances that are available for Ethernet will be available for Rocky too. Rocky works with all advanced Ethernet signaling, signaling rates, meaning that Rocky can be, Rocky is working on 100, 100 gigabit Ethernet. Common traffic management and monitoring tools work with Rocky. For example, TCP dump has support for sniffing Rocky packets, even in FreeBSD. This is something that was pushed after updating lib pickup. 
Rocky requires lossless network. This is true, but we have great mechanisms for supporting that. Rocky is supported by multiple vendors. It is. It's not only Mellanox. And Rocky interoperability between different vendors is regularly tested by IBTA, by the InfiniBand Association. Actually, this is happening twice a year and being published for general availability. Any questions? Awesome. So, Rocky has a lot of application. We can we can accelerate MPI applications, for example. We can accelerate HPC applications. And one of the interesting points that we have is that Rocky can accelerate storage protocols. All those storage protocols that everyone are using, like iSCSI, like NFS, like NVMe, like Samba, which I'm not going to talk about. But basically, all of them can be accelerated using Rocky. So let's start from the first example, which is actually already implemented for FreeBSD, which is ICER. ICER is basically an iSCSI extension for RDMA. We are using iSCSI, and instead of using the TCP stack as the transport layer, we're actually using RDMA. The benefits, of course, just like any other RDMA or Rocky application, will be high bandwidth, high IOPS, low latency, we will reduce CPU usage, and of course, all the iSCSI management tools are available. So here are some ICER performance examples on both on ConnectX4 and ConnectX4 Elix for 25 and 100 gig. So from this graph, you can see that using um, one small thing that I have to mention, those performance results are were done on Linux and not on FreeBSD, unfortunately. Um, so as you can see that using 512 bytes as a block size for I.O., you can see that we can get three times better performance from I.O. perspective. We can get almost three times better latency using ICER and almost four times better bandwidth using latency. Again, I'm comparing the same devices, the same PCs, the same computers, the same everything, just using RDMA and using regular TCP. From CPU performance, we can see that we can get almost four, four and a half times better from CPU utilization. NFS over RDMA, which is unfortunately not available yet for FreeBSD, Basically, the idea that when there was, a, and I'm pretty sure that most of you, if not all, are familiar with NFS. Um, when NFS was introduced, it was introduced on 10 megabit Ethernet. And the migration to 100 megabit actually showed much performance improvements. On the other hand, the next generation didn't show that much improvement on in the other, from, and from the CPU utilization perspective, NFS was much worse when migrating to faster networks. So here I'll show some performance results done by Oracle, actually. So you can see, again, that we gain almost four times better on the read IOPS and much better on the write. You can see that almost three times better, both on 16 was on one thread, sorry, and on six threads, as you can see here, using big block sizes. And for 4K and 8K, we see the same picture, basically, from NFS over RDMA point of view. The next protocol that I would like to talk about is NVMe over Fabrics, which, again, is unfortunately not available for FreeBSD yet. Um, Basically, NVMe is non-volatile memory express, allows you to have an SSD device basically attached to your PCI. NVMe over Fabrics allows you to write using RDMA to NVMe devices from remote. 
So here are some performance measurements for Connectix 5, for example. And from this graph, you can see that the performance for doing an NVMF device, meaning NVMe over fabric, is almost like doing a local write. And again, from throughput and IOPS perspective, you can see that using NVMF or NVMe over fabrics, we can get to up to 4 million IOPS on small block sizes, and we get to almost saturating the whole link in 4K. Questions? Right. Exactly. Right. And even, even with the new generation, like the SOC, we can offload the target completely. You can have the whole target inside the NIC itself. Bluefield. Which one? What each color means. So um, the blue one is RDMA write IOPS. Okay. The orange one is IP over IP write IOPS. I, okay. it's, it's actually not comparing real TCP to, no, R, to RDMA. It's basically comparing IP over IP to RDMA. And then RDMA, RDMA read IOPS and IP over IP read IOPS. It's read write and RDMA versus IP over IP. Yes, of course. So, uh, for uh, so for RDMF, my understanding uh, is that basically the, um, the card will, uh, the write coming in. Barely hear you, sorry. For RDMF, if a write is coming in, the NIC is going to put the data in, you know, into memory and the NIC is going to issue the um, so, I'm not an NVMe expert, but as far as I understand how it works is basically that by using the NVMe protocol, first of all, we have to understand that NVMe is not SCSI, right? Yeah. NVMe is NVMe. So, as, as far as I understand, when we get the NVMe message on, on the wire to the card itself, it will just put the, the data or the buffer directly on the NVMe device over the PCI instead of going up to the CPU and back. Yeah, that's what, I, that's what I'm saying. The NIC is putting the, uh, it's, it's doing the buffer from what comes in over the network, and then the NIC is sending the right command to... Directly on the PCI to the NVMe device. Okay, thank you. Other questions? So, so th this is the point that I'm not sure about and I want to commit to, but as far as I understand, there will no be there, no, there, no, no security intervention, but this double DMA. So I'm not sure if there will be a double DMA. Th this is what I'm not sure about, but I think that it will be a direct DMA to the NVMe device itself. But this one I'll have to check because I'm not sure about it. Of course. Multicast? You mean Rocky Multicast? RDMA multicast, basically. Yes. 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 And actually, we have the MC key application located in the same place. I think it's under RDMA applications, under LibRDMA. And MC key is basically um, a user space application which uses multicast for RDMA traffic.
that will reduce the need for uh, contemporary smartphones. So, you know, future generations in connecting six and X and, and, and beyond and, and onwards, we want, we want, we want internet. Or, or yeah, is it what's called I work or do you? No. no. So basically what will happen, just like I demonstrated in the next generations, instead of resending everything from the, the lost packet and, and force, we can just resend the lost packet itself instead of resending everything. This is what many was trying to describe about the next generations. Right. But, but better to, to not lose anything. Right, of course. So, so basically about the complementary protocols, the, the best practice that we recommend will be to use <coughs> PFC or global pause, which is, of course, PFC because it has better granularity, and ECN. Because ECN still allows a little bit of traffic to be dropped, and when using global pause, there is no chance, or PFC, of course, there is no chance for traffic loss. Um, ECN is implemented in hardware, for example. Yes, of course. So the, uh, the packet which contains the ECM bit, that's the, um, that's the act that the uh, receiver starts to say, I got that packet, but I'm also getting full slow down. So I'll, uh, I wasn't sure if I have enough time to talk about ECM, because ECM is, but I do have. So let's so we'll talk about, the, uh, about it a little bit. So what happens with ECM that, first of all, the, if you like have two servers connected back to back, you will not have ECN at all. So what happens with ECN that the intermediate devices, the switches and the routers must support ECN. What basically happens is when the threshold in the intermediate devices buffers gets to a certain point, this packet will be marked, like both bits will be um, turned on and when the receiver side will get a, a, a regular packet with those two bits on, but in hardware it will generate those special packet called CNP, which is a congestion notification packet, sending it directly to the sender asking him to slow down the traffic. Okay, okay. awesome. Any further questions? So I think that's it. Thank you everybody for joining me today.